Okay, I think I'll go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone. I wanted to say welcome to the archaeology section of From Ancient to Modern, the Tari Research Conference. In this conference, scholars and colleagues from across Iraq and internationally discuss the various research being conducted in and on Iraq. Due to continued health concerns, the conference includes this virtual component. And then there will be a conference at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art in Washington, DC next year. Uh, my name is Jean Evans. I'm the deputy director and chief curator of the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago. Um, I will be moderating this session and I'm filling in for Dr. Hamdani who was unable to attend today. So this, se this session on archeological projects in Iraq will include five presentations from scholars followed by a discussion with questions taken from the audience. And you can use the Q&A function to ask your questions. So I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we'll have about two hours and we've asked um, each of the presenters to speak for about 15 minutes. So we will have a lot of time at the end. Uh, so please do ask any questions that you might have. So getting started, our first speaker is Dr. Badir Albadron. Dr. Albadron is Chancellor of al makala University in Basra. He is a geologist specializing in marine sedimentology, and he's held a number of scholarly positions at the University of Basra's Marine Science Center. Dr. Albadron has published most recently his research on Iraq's southern marshes, the geology of Iraqi territorial waters, and the tidal flats of Coral Zubair. The title of his talk today is The Limits of Holocene Marine Transgression into Southern Mesopotamia. Uh, welcome, Dr. Albadron. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Oh, did, do you see the, the slides or not? No. Uh, no, we do not. Um, share screen, yes, 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 yes. Now, is it okay? Yes, now we can see your PowerPoint. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. So this is our paper is the limit of Holocene marine transmission into Southern Mesopotamia. It's presented by Cornell and me. So just, I want to show you on this research, we try to review most of the literature's review about the coastal evolution of the Shuttle Arab River region with respect to relative sea level change. First, I am a geologist. I am not archaeologist. So all my speech is geology, not archaeology. Uh, to in addition to this, the search and studies that have been achieved by our students and under our super supervision that have been completed on the southern part of the Mesopotamian plain in order to come out with a conclusion about the situation of the region and its relationship to sea level change. First, uh, maybe uh, this is better now or not? Is it okay now? Mm -hmm. Yes, that looks good. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, yes. okay, thank you. So first slides, which I want to present it, is the work of the Akrawi at 1985. And uh, he shown th that the, the Hamar formation, which represents the period of transgression, you see, this is the Hamar formation, this is the color of Hamar formation. And you see the distribution of this formation, you have the maximum thickness here in Basra region and here in Amara and little bit near Nasriya. 
And this represents, as I told you, it, to you, this is the period of sea level rising or the marine transgression. So for Akrawi, this is the thickness of Hamar formation in that area in Nasiriyah, but the max maximum thickness is in Basra region. When I say that the marine transgression, which we are interested is the about between six to four thousands year before presence. This is the, this is the the last of the, this or this is the period of deglaciation. You know the last glaciation in the area is about nine thousand year before presence. So all of that which we say about the Hamar formation and the recent formation is from the middle Holocene, Holocene to recent. And uh, the second one is also Akrawi 1985. Shown here is the illustration and through the model of approximate expected period of the formation of the Hamar or the formation of the Ahwar. And you see in that period, semi-arid, it's more than 7,000, then seven to 6,000, between six and 4,000. And in the last, about 3,000 years before present, we have here is the formation of the Ahwar area. This is which we say the period of, or the maximum transgression in that area. Then Pornell 2003 proposed a map according to the distribution of the archeological sites. And you see, Cornell proposed that the transgression or the sea level rising reached Amara. You have here Amara. Here is the Nasiriya. And you see Uruk, Larsa, Ubaid, Rido, Ur, Tel al -Laham. This is the period of maximum transgression is about or around 4,000 before present. So then we have the Hivrit and Batman at 2007. They work on the Khuzestan. This is the, means the Western part of Iran, just the, to the east of the Shat al-Arab. This is the Tigris, and you have the Shat al Arab. Is it clear for you? Sorry, is it okay? Mm -hmm. And you have here, you have here the Khuzestan area. Just which we are interested in that part, you see here, they said this this is the tidal flat, and this is the flood plain at 8,000, about 8,000 before present. And 5,000 is the area. And you have the coastal Sabha, little part here, the coastal Sabha. We continue with the size of, of uh, Hivrit at Batman 2007. But here you have 2,500 before present. This is the limit also of the tidal floods and the flood plain in the area, which is a little bit, little the area covered by the flood or tidal flood. Also in 1550, this is the areas of the tidal flood and the flood plain. So, in 1240, you see here 
vector here, you see that this is a supratidal, which means the period of regression or the moment of starting of regression and also at 450, this is the area of the supratidals more distributed and covered by maximum area and the rest of the area is the flood, tidal flat and the flood plain. Al Shiakhli at 2017, Ad Ital worked on that area near the, Tig uh, the Tigris River and Shat al Arab. And they concluded that at the moment of eight to 7,000 before present, you have here the delta or the delta area. And this is the small part which is covered by marine at that moment. And this at 6,000 6, to 5,000 before present, maybe this for them is the maximum flooding or maximum transgression in the area. And you see that the area is more bigger of the deltaic and the marine. Also for al Shekhli, Ital at 2017, you have here 1,000 for present. It is the period of regression and the sea level was descend more and more and the area become as back swamps and marshes. Whereas for Al Hawi Ital 2017 also, propose many models about the area according to the distribution of the archeological sites. And they say that there is no transgression in the area, especially in Al Hamar area. This is for nine to 5,000 before present. And here, this is the five to one, 500 before present. The shrinkage of the Ahwar, and here you in red color circle, this is the archeological sites which appeared in that area. Still with Al Hawi et al. 2017, in 1,300 before present, it, this is, you have the Alhamar Lake and the flood plain marsh area. The, at that moment, you have here the many archeological sites which were covered by the Alhamar water, whereas the other is still in the flood plain in the area. Also, still with Al Hawi et al. 2017, you know, the southern part of Iraq, we know that it's tectonically active. And we found that there is a very good relationship between the subsurface geology and the geomorphological of the area. You have here, sorry, this is the old way or old course of the Euphrates River, but due to the subsurface geology, due to the subsurface anticline in that area, which is the oil field, you have the moving or 
change of the course of the Euphrates River from that area to the actual area near Al Chibaish and Medina to Kurna. So we thought, well, we think that there is a very good relationship between the subsurface geology or the subsurface tectonic in the area with the older distribution in the, in the area of, of the river and the archeological sites. You have here, still at Howie 2017, you know here, this is with, 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 with isotope radiocarbon, a telelaham, marine bivalve, still laham, marine bivalve, seagrass, or is, is trying to intertide. It means not pure marine, not pure marine, near or still you have the brackish marsh, brackish marsh. It means that the, maybe there is some limit between there or the tell is little bit influenced by the marine water, whereas the or no, it's brackish marsh. So, at the Razag et al. 2017, tried with, with, with the remote sensing and with the satellite image, and we tried to rise the sea level by three meter, as all the literature say that the area are covered by the rising of the sea level at that moment is around four to 3,000 years before present. The rising of sea level at that moment is about three to five meter. And when we rise the sea level, you see the area which is covered by marine water. But the covering of the area is not completely, so from side to side, there is some change, change in the color you have the blue color, color is the marine influence or the marine covering, whereas the green color is the area. This is the covering when we tried to rise sea level about five, five meter. We know this area is tectonically active. And we think that always there is uplift in the area. Some literature, at, at about uh, 1950, 1952, less and Falcon, they said that the, there is a subsidence in the area. But for us, we think that always we have, there is uplift and the evidence of the uplift is the formation of the oil field and the subsurface anticline in that area. This is the covering after rising sea level by five meter. But there is some ambiguity, plus minus. This side one, side two, for Abdul Razak et al. at 2017. And we see, we saw that in site one, not completely marine, brackish, whereas the site two, no. There is species, mollusk species, which explain there is a transgression in the area. Here you have the Pornia at 2019, at Tel Harir, just to the north of Basra. And there is some relationship between or the or the indication of the age. We have the marine lower estuarine to marine environment. And we found this is the influence of little bit of marine environment about 
4.8 meters below the ground surface, but always we have the marsh to fluvial environment in the surface or near the surface. And we say we have, or we see there is a relation or according to the, to the recent history of the area between Seljuk, Abbasid, Sassanian to await and await in Neolithic. Al Kabi at nine, 2019, she worked on the area. And this is one core, another core, third core, and fourth, fifth core. She found that th this area is or she found that all the mollusk species belongs to fluvial or lacustrine or brackish, no marine. Whereas in Basra region, and that area is marine species. So from all the literature, and from our works in the area, we try to propose a model, little bit with some area, or maybe there is some movement in the limit here. And we think that this is the area which is completely influenced, but by marine transgression between four to 3,000 before present in that area. This limit is the course of the Tigris River and the Shabt al Arab River, maybe due to the elevation of the area, which is the lowest ele elevation comparing with the other area. Whereas when we move to the marsh area, really the maximum works which we which they done here explain that there is no marine, but there is deltaic, deltaic influence due to the flow of Tigris River and Euphrates River at the moment where the flow of the two rivers were very high and which tried to push the wave of the marine in that area. Whereas to the eastern side near the Shat al Arab and Tigris River, we think this is the tidal flag in that area. This is what I want to show from the previous works and our works in the area. And we continue with our work to put exactly the limit of the transgression or the version of the marine in that area. And thank you very much for your listening. Thank you very much. Um, as we said previously, we will um, save all questions until the end. So thank you very much. And we will go on to our next speaker now, which is Dr. Holly Pittman. Uh, Dr. Pittman is Bach Family Professor in the Humanities at the University of Pennsylvania. She has excavated in Cyprus, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran, and has had primary publication responsibilities in the art, and especially the glyptic art, from the sites of Malyan, uh, Rook period Tel Brak, and Rook period Haji Nebi Tepe. Since 2007, Dr. Pittman has supervised the publication of the legacy excavations at Tel El Pippa. And in 2018, she received a five-year permit to initiate new excavations at the site. The title of her talk is Returning to Lagash, 
new excavations building on previous campaigns. Thank you very much, Jean. Uh, can everybody see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, that's, yeah. that's lucky. Okay, thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Albedron. I look forward to uh, working with you and talking with you about your very exciting results. Um, for almost seven weeks, uh, from March 13th to April 30th in 2019, the Penn Museum initiated a new campaign of excavations at the site of Al Hiba in southern Iraq, with substantial support from the Metropolitan Museum, National Geographic, and in collaboration with the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. Al Hiba is an enormous archaeological site, one of the largest in southern Mesopotamia, covering at its greatest extent more than 600 hectares. It is located in the Dihar province around uh, 200 kilometers north of the modern city of Basra. During the early dynastic period in the middle of the third millennium BC, Al Hiba was the capital of the city state of Lagash, which comprised, was comprised of three sites, Negan, modern Zogol, Lagash, modern Al Hiba, and Girsu, modern Tello. At the height of its power, contemporary with the Royal Cemetery, or the city state of Lagash vied with Uma, Uruk and Nippur before the unification of southern Mesopotamia under Sargon of Akkad around 2300 BC. Ours are not the first excavations at the site. With the support of the Penn Museum, I participated in the work in 1990 when Donald Hansen of the Institute of Fine Arts of New York um, returned to the site for his sixth and what, out, what turned out to be his last season. When Hansen died in 2007, I inherited the excavation archive and set to work with students to fully digitize and publish the results of his work in a series of volumes that are now beginning to appear. The ceramic volume prepared by Dr. Steve Renette will be published at the end of the month. Three more are in final stages of preparation with um, the early dynastic one area G, Temple Oval, uh, here and areas A and B, the early dynastic three uh, Bagara and Ibgal temples uh, prepared by Dr. Darren Ashby and ED3 area C um, administrative complex um, working with the dissertation by um, Zena Bahrani has been prepared by Giacomo Benati, uh, Mark Marin Webb and myself. In this presentation, I will focus on the work accomplished in the 2019 season and briefly describe our plans to return to the field later this month. The 2019 season was led by myself and Augusta McMahon. For that season, Professor Emily Hammer, Assistant Professor at the University of Pennsylvania, served as the Assistant Director of the project and oversaw mapping, survey, and magnetometry aspects of the field work. We were also joined by Professor Sara Pizzamente, senior lecturer at the University of Pisa as our ceramicist. In coming season, she will assume greater responsibility in the field. Supporting us as project manager was Dr. Zaid Al-Rawi, who we see over here on the far right, um, who wasn't with us when we took our team photo. In addition, we had four graduate or postdoctoral students from Penn, one from Johns Hopkins and two from Cambridge. A preliminary report um, of the 2019 season authored by Augusta McMahon with contributions by team members has been submitted to antiquity. This brief summary of our re results draws on that report. Given the extensive results of monumental architecture of major political and religious institutions revealed by earlier excavations, the current project takes, multi, takes a multi-scalar approach that forefronts environmental studies, remote sensing, and excavation. Initial results suggest that the site was densely occupied during the second half of the third millennium, divided into discrete sectors a pattern observed in other contemporary urban settings of the region. 
One of the goals of the 2019 season was to undertake a systematic survey that complemented and extended the walking survey of Elizabeth Carter in 1984. Emily Hammer developed the sampling strategy um, and directed team members in collection. Sarah Pizzamente analyzed the pottery. The combined, the, the combined efforts, these combined efforts confirm that virtually the entire site was occupied during the late early dynastic period. By the beginning of the old Akkadian period, the population had severely shrunk, perhaps due to the shifting Tigris River. This in part explains why the mound itself is so low, rising only six meters above the level of the plain at its highest. This affords us a marvelous research opportunity to explore the urban fabric of a major early Mesopotamian city without having to dig through extensive overburden. The drone photography was also accomplished by Hammer and it revealed traces, clear traces of architecture on the surface of the mound made even more visible thanks to intermittent but frequent rain. One area of considerable interest was revealed uh, to the east of area G where monumental, perhaps sacred architecture is clearly visible um, on the surface. Another area south of area H over here um, is where we can see a substantial buttressed wall pierced by a gate that is um, clearly visible both in the, um, in the drone photography and in magnetometry. The third remote sensing technique applied by Hammer was gradient radio magnetometry. She reports that 14 hectares were surveyed in four test areas marked um, on the plan in blue using a Bartington Grad 601-2 flux gate mag magnetic radiometer. South of area H, when we're looking at, so here's area H here, so down here, a substantial wall visible on the surface became even more pronounced through this remote sensing. This technique, which has been so successfully applied at a number of sites in Southern Mesopotamia is one that we will prioritize in future seasons. In addition to surface reconnaissance, two trenches were open. In area G, we adequately established the relationship between the oval wall and a complex of rooms with administrative residue in the West, which was left unresolved by Hansen's earlier excavations. And in area H, Augusta McMahon opened a 10 by 10 meter square in an area designated, um, located at the southern end of the site that had been identified in 1984 at, in the survey then as a pottery production site through the dense um, remains of slag, wasters, and ash. There she recovered, as you can see on the slide, five fire pits of five pottery kilns, huge quantities of pottery of early dynastic three date. She recovered thousands of date pits, which had been, which had been used for fuel, one of the earliest documented uh, uses of that practice. Small finds were by and large unremarkable and consisted of clay and stone tools with very little metal. An interesting variety of small finds, including ceilings and animal figurines, were found redeposited in the decommissioned kilns of Area H as trash. Craft production in the context of the early dynastic city-states is one of the most important research questions that we will focus on going forward. Of all of the artifact types, ceramics is the most important. In the fall of 2019, we held a ceramic workshop at Penn led by Steve Renette and Sarah Pizzamente, seeking to develop a multi-scalar research project that will involve specialists in laboratory techniques. The other important research trajectory that we initiated in the 2019 season was long-term environmental reconstruction of the Lagash city-state. This consisted of coring at strategic points on and off the mound that have provided securely, securely dated sediments recording the shifting hydrolo hydrological regime in the state of Lagash. This work is the doctoral project of Mr. Reed Goodman in collaboration with uh, Dr. Levue Geosan at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And we have been supported in this by close collaboration with Dr. Badir Albadron and his students, 
um, and we look forward to continuing that collaboration. Laboratory work on these sediments has been extremely promising, and we anticipate that the dating techniques applied will allow for, to, for confident anchoring of fluvial and seawater interaction during the fourth and early third millennium BCE, complementing the work of Dr. Albedron and Pornell, when city-states in the southern alluvium were appearing in what was certainly a marshy environment. We had originally planned, as many teams had, to return for a second season in March 2020, but the pandemic hit and brought all of those plans to a halt. A team of four will go to Iraq later this month for three weeks. The primary goal of this short season will be to acquire more sediment cores necessary to continue the geological work. Reed Goodman will be accompanied by Dr. Florin Philippe of Budapest University, a geolo geological expert in drilling fluvial regimes, and Dr. Albedron and his students. They will be using a drill capable of extracting the deep cores necessary to establish the long sequence of hydrological history in the Delta. The plan is to drop one core near the Shat al Arab, another at Lagash, and a final one at Ur, where the Penn Museum now holds the permit for excavation and conservation. Also during those weeks, we will fly a drone over Lagash in order to expand the record of the surface beyond the one captured in 2019. If we are lucky, there will be enough rain to again robustly reveal traces of architecture on the surface. It is our intention further to return to the site uh, in the spring of 2020 for a regular season of excavation, survey, and remote sensing. Then we will develop a strategy for recording and ground truthing the architecture and activity features visible on the mound. We will combine that with a highly strategic plan of excavation guided by the results of drone photography and magnetometry, which will allow us to at least estimate um, what we will be encountering before putting any sh shovels in the ground. I want to thank all of the participants of the 2019 Lagash Archaeological uh, Project. In particular, thanks to our financial supporters, the University of Pennsylvania Research Fund, the Charles K. William Fund, the Kolb Society, the Penn Museum, National Geographic, National Science Foundation, the British School of Archaeology, the Ricketts Fund at the University of Cambridge, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art for their generous support of our work. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pittman. Um, as I said previously, we will save all questions until the end. So I would like to go ahead and move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Glenn Schwartz. Dr. Schwartz is a Near Eastern archeologist whose research focuses on the emergence and early history of urban societies in Syria and Mesopotamia. His previous field project uh, at Tel Umo Mara in Syria concentrated on the problems of origins, collapse, and regeneration of an early urban center. Before that, his research at Tel al Rakai concerned the role of small rural communities in early urban and complex societies. His recent publications include the edited volumes After Collapse, The Regeneration of Complex Societies, and Sacred Killing, The Archaeology of Sacrifice in the Ancient Near East. Today, Dr. Schwartz will talk about his current field project with a talk entitled, Excavations at Kurd Kabristan, Recent Results at a Second Millennium BC Urban Site on the Arabial Plain. Okay, can you see my slide? Yes, we can. Great, thank you, Jean. And I'd like to thank uh, Amanda for organizing this um, quite stimulating conference. So um, in this paper, I aim to discuss the Cord Cabristan project and briefly present some of its notable results, but of course they'll be in quite abbreviated form give, given our time constraints. Um, Cord Cabristan, uh, located 22 kilometers southwest of Erbil in the Kurdistan region of Iraq, is one of the largest Bronze Age archaeological sites on the Erbil Plain. 
The site area totals at least 95 hectares, comprising an 11 hectare high mound and a walled 89 hectare lower town. <clears throat> because of its extensive occupation in the second millennium BC, Cord Cobrestan provides an opportunity to study the nature of Northern Mesopotamian urbanism in that period. Research sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University began at the site in 2013, and we conducted additional excavation seasons in 2014 and 2017, and a study season in 2016. Um, various political and then um, uh, pandemic related uh, problems have prevented us from having a season since then, unfortunately. Um, a preliminary report on our most recent um, results was recently submitted to the journal Iraq, and I hope that that will be coming out soon. We are concentrating in particular on two periods of occupation. The earlier is the Middle Bronze Age or MB period, uh, circa 2000 to 1600 BC, which has widespread occupation on the upper and lower town. Having noted the large size of the MB site and its apparent city wall on Corona images, satellite images, and also on his 2012 surface survey, Jason Ur proposed that Cord Cabrestan was ancient Cabra. Cabra was the capital of the Erbil area in the Middle Bronze period and is best known for its defeat by the joint forces of Shamshi Adad, king of Upper Mesopotamia, and Dadusha, king of Eshnunna, both of whom commemorated the event on stone stelas. The second era of interest is the Mitanni period of the late Bronze Age. Oops, um, that's, I don't wanna have that one. Um, the Mitanni period circa 1600 to 1300, when occupation retracted largely to the high mound, but was still sizable. <clears throat> Through studying the early and mid second millennium BC occupations at Port Cabrestan, we hope to make progress on filling several gaps in research. Despite the well known characterization of Mesopotamia as the heartland of cities, there has been little investigation of early to mid second millennium urbanism in northern Iraq. Further, the Middle Bronze and Mitanni periods have until now been very rarely examined archaeologically in the Erbil region. So I begin with the Middle Bronze period. <clears throat> in this occupation, evidence is found in all parts of the site, indicating a size of 95 hectares. A sounding in the uh, lower town uh, northeast contained only Middle Bronze material from the top of the site down to virgin soil, which suggests um, that the site expanded dramatically to include the lower town in Middle Bronze Age and contracted afterwards. This conclusion is supported by the predominance of Middle Bronze pottery sherds scattered on the surface of the lower town throughout its 89 hectare extent. Soundings in the vicinity of, vicinity of the city wall have confirmed the date of that feature is likewise Middle Bronze. On the lower town north, excavations exposed Middle Bronze Age rooms with numerous uh, smashed vessels, implying that the structures had been abandoned before the inhabitants could remove their pottery. Whether this event is to be connected with the conquest of Cabra by Shamshi Adad and Dadusha is tempting to consider, but remains to be seen. <clears throat> on the high mound, substantial middle bronze remains were exposed in a step trench on the northern slope. Here, a thick mud brick construction is best interpreted as an enclosure wall encircling the high mound. This wall was covered with debris that included burned ceiling material, suggesting that elements from higher structures had fallen on top of the wall. Indeed, farther up the slope was more large scale architecture associated with burned roof fragments. We see a plan of the area here. More modest Middle Bronze architecture was extant on the southern slope of the high mound. Uh, also found here, oh, yeah, here's some shots of that. Also found here were pit burials, such as that of an infant inside a large open vessel with horizontal ribs, a funerary type well known in Southern Mesopotamia. And sometimes we, we do get 
interesting um, attestations of Southern Mesopotamian material culture cropping up. A clay jar ceiling found in this area had an old Babylonian cylinder seal impression showing a suppliant goddess and an ascending god. Excavation alone is insufficient for investigating a site as large as 95 hectares, or indeed larger, depending on which uh, period you're, you're talking about. And we are con conducting a program of geophysical survey directed by Andrew Creekmore of the University of Northern Colorado. Of particular use is magnetometry. And so far, 48 hectares of the lower town have been surveyed. Since our excavations show the middle bronze architecture is to be found immediately below the surface on much of the lower town, we conclude that most of the surveyed area documents the latest phase of the middle bronze settlement. One can recognize a system of streets, dense neighborhoods, and a city wall with towers at 20 meter intervals. Of particular interest is a large building in the eastern lower town, measuring 45 by 88 meters with two large square courtyards. <clears throat> Comparison with Middle Bronze Age temples elsewhere in Mesopotamia at sites like Tel Arima, Ashur, and Larsa uh, indicate that this building is to be identified as a temple. <clears throat> Limited excavations here have confirmed its Middle Bronze date. When investigating the temple at Tel Arima, David Oates identified Babylonian characteristics and suggested that the building was sponsored by Shamshi Adad, whose predilection for Babylonian material culture styles is well attested. The temple at Ashur, displaying similarities to our building, was also built under the aegis of Shamshi Adad. To the south, the Larsa temple was sponsored by Hammurabi of Babylon. This is interesting because Madeline Fitzgerald has proposed that after conquering new areas, both Shamshi Adad and Hammurabi built new temples or restored old ones to consolidate their rule in those regions. So it may be possible that the Kord Kabristan temple is an example of such a project initiated by Shamshi Adad. If so, the divergence of the building's orientation, sorry, um, from the surrounding architecture may signal its later imposition. As you see, its, its orientation is sort of northwest, uh, northeast, southwest, as opposed to the kind of north-south orientation of the architecture around it. The pottery from the Middle Bronze Age occupation includes chaborware and other well-known Middle Bronze types. Since there are many parallels with pottery from Mari and Tel Leilan in the Shamshi Ada and Zimri Lim era, a date in the middle MB seems likely. Such a date is now supported by three carbon-14 dates from the burn debris in the high mound north and also one from the lower town, lower town north, all of which cluster around 1800 BC. This dating would accord well with the proposed identification of Port Kabristan with Cabra, of course. It's not it, conclusive. Um, yeah. Okay, turning to the late Bronze Age, Settlement of Kord Kabristan significantly dis diminished, but still occupied the entirety of the high mound. On the high mound east, we have documented three late bronze phases. The earliest, phase three, included a, ba a baked brick bath and a toilet, implying an elite status for this architecture. Comparisons might be made with elite residential architecture at Nuzi uh, to the east. In the middle phase, two was a bone tool workshop, among whose finds was a Matani common style cylinder seal. The latest phase, uh, one, was quite fragmentary, but included several burials, including that of a child and an adult female. On the high mound north, excavations detected little late bronze architecture, but here too, they exposed an interesting pit burial. This interment included the disarticulated bones of a human adult and child, together with the bones of an adult, adult and juvenile sheep and goat next to a small jar. Found with the human bones were four baked clay human statuettes. I mean, the, the two to the left are fairly large. We, I think one could call them statuettes. And then two smaller uh, uh, figures. Um, three of the four are, apparently are male. 
And then obviously the, um, this one is female with these interesting uh, crisscrossed bronze toggle pins on, on the torso. Whether these figures represent the individuals buried in the grave or have another significance remains to be determined. Analysis of pottery from the three LB phases in the high mound east reveal a rather homogeneous assemblage. Given the presence of the early LB type known as black burnished ware with white, black burnished white paste inlay, inlay ware, I have hypothesized that this assemblage dates to early in the Mitanni period. Contributing now to the chronological, the chronological discussion are eight carbon 14 dates from the high mound east studied by Lindell Webster of the Austrian Academy of Sciences who conducted a Bayesian analysis. The results placed the earliest LB phase, phase three, in the late 16th century, which you can see here. And then um, the, the uh, later two phases, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is the middle bronze. This, here's the um, phase three. And then the later two phases are um, early uh, 15th century. These results support the dating of the pottery to, to an early Mitanni period. However, the 16th to 15th century dates raise the question of whether phases three and two might in fact precede the era of Mitanni control. The absorption of Erbil into the Mitanni kingdom occurred no later than the reign of Sashtatar in the later 15th century, but it's not clear whether Mitanni held sway over the area before then. And it is possible that our earlier LB occupations predate the Mitanni presence in this region. If so, they provide a rare view of an early LB assemblage that is also pre-Mitanni. Given uh, time constraints, I only briefly mentioned uh, our equifactual analysis. Our faunal analyst, Jill Weber of the University of Pennsylvania has noted the prevalence of sheep and goat followed by pig and cattle in both middle and late bronze contexts. The presence of cattle and pig indicates a relatively wet environment in the region in the second millennium, contra contradicting inferences of the dry climate in this period. Archaeobotanical analysis conducted by Alexia Smith of the University of Connecticut has revealed that barley was by far the most common food plant in the second millennium, followed by bread wheat. An interesting discovery by Dr. Smith is the evidence of non-type flatbread in the middle bronze remains discovered by use of a scanning electron microscopy. To conclude, it's now clear that the Middle Bronze Age was the major period of occupation at Fort Kabristan with a 40, fortified 95 hectare expanse, a 45, 11 hectare high mound, and at least one monumental building identified as a temple. Unlike characterizations of, of MB centers like Rima and Leilan as hollow, city, hollow cities, the geophysical results show that Kord Kabristan was densely populated. In the Late Bronze Age, we observe a sequence of early LB levels that included evidence of elite architecture, craft production, and diverse burials. Since neither the Middle Bronze or early LB is well known in the Arabial region, our results are beginning to fill a lacuna in the archaeology of the area. Likewise, we're beginning to learn something about the nature of a second millennium North Mesopotamian city. I'd like to close by thanking our colleagues in Iraq for their support. I'm especially grateful to the Director General, Directorate General of Antiquities of the Kurdistan Regional Government, particularly Kak Kefi Mustafa, Director General, and Kak Nada Babakar, the Director of the Erbil Region. I'm also grateful to our financial supporters, including the National Science Foundation, National Geographic Society, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and other contributors. And of course, to the team for its excellent work. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Schwartz. Moving on to our next speaker, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tracy Spurrier. Dr. Spurrier is currently a sessional lecturer at the University of Toronto, where in 2020, she earned her PhD in Near Eastern Archaeology with a digital archaeology dissertation on the art and architecture of Sennacherib's Southwest Palace at Nineveh. She has worked on excavations in Spain, Egypt, Turkey, and Syria, and was assistant curator at the Royal Ontario Museum for the exhibition Mesopotamia, Inventing Our World. The title of her talk today is Introducing Hama, the discovery of a lost new Assyrian queen laid to rest amongst a curious cache 
of bronze coffins in the Nimrud tombs. Okay, hello, and uh, can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you so much for letting me into this, this symposium, and I'm really excited to kind of share some of the research I've been doing over the past few years uh, with all of you. And thank you to Tari for organizing uh, this great conference. When Queen Melissa Mukhanashat Ninawa passed away and was buried in her tomb, she left a curse to those who would dare disturb her final resting place. Despite her warning, late 1980s excavations in the Northwest Palace of King Ashurnasirpal II and Nimrud, conducted by the State Board of Antiquities and Heritage of Iraq, revealed the existence of her burial and those of a number of other Neo-Assyrian royal queens. This was an extraordinary find with gold and elite goods rivaling King Tut. Unfortunately, the discovery was overshadowed by the first Gulf War, and the queens did not get the international recognition they deserved. For some individuals, texts were present naming the buried queens, but a number of tombs and coffins contain the skeletal remains of more than one person. This has led to many proposed theories about the identities of these people and the circumstances surrounding their burials. In this talk, I will be discussing a curious cache of bronze coffins found in the antechamber to tomb three, more specifically, the individual in coffin two. By examining the archeological skeletal and textual data in tandem, I've been able to identify the woman who was found wearing the most famous gold crown of all the Nimrud treasures, and will further argue that her coffin interment was a primary, not secondary burial, which is the case for the other coffins. And who is the rightful owner? Her name is Hama, wife of Shalmaneser IV, daughter-in-law of Adonirari Nurari III. This information is known from a gold stamp seal pendant buried with the almost complete skeleton of a young woman. Uh, the site of Nimrud, as most of you uh, know, it, ancient Kalhu is located in modern day Northern Iraq on the Tigris River. This was the region known as Assyria, homeland to the Neo-Assyrian empire, which held hegemonic control over much of the ancient Near East from 883 to 609 BC. It was established as the capital of the Neo-Assyrian Empire in the ninth century by Ashurnasirpal II and had continuous occupation as said capital for nearly two centuries. The Northwest Palace of Ashurnasirpal was built on the Citadel Mound of Kalhu and its remains can still be seen today. The Queen's tombs were built in the Southern area of the palace, which was a domestic quarter known as the Betanu. This was where the residential suites and storerooms were located. The title of a queen, Munas Egal, literally translates to woman of the palace, not queen. Only foreign female rulers were given the title Sharutum, the feminine of the word for king, Sharum. The main consort to the king belonged to the palace and ruled the Betanu, which is why it is believed that the tombs were built in this area. It is quite common in the Near East to have burials under the floors of houses. Excavations uncovered four tomb chambers containing three stone sarcophagi, one clay coffin, and three bronze coffins. The tombs were constructed with baked brick and had vaulted roofs. A shaft with stairs at the end opened into an antechamber, which further led into the main chamber. In most tombs, this room was sealed closed by a double stone door that pivoted on stone rings. The stone sarcophagi were so large, they were placed into the tombs prior to construction being finished. Like each tomb, the coffins and sarcophagi were also unique in shape and size. Even the three bronze coffins found together outside tomb three were all slightly different. And these would be the bronze coffins here. Regarding the people buried in the tombs, when collected, the bones were placed into plastic bags, one per tomb or coffin, and then put into storage in the museum. In 1997, nearly a decade later, Osteologist Michael Schultz conducted a paleopathological study analyzing the skeletal remains and recording all available data. The report documented the remains of at least 17 individuals in various interments within the tomb. They were represented by full skeletons, fragmentary skeletons, single bones, or teeth. Now the focus of this talk, the bronze coffins, in particular coffin two. Note the English summary given at the end of a German paleopathological report lists two individuals buried in this coffin, a woman and a child. This is a somewhat misleading statement. Tomb three belonged to Melissa Makanashat Ninua, wife of Ashurnasir Paul II, the builder of the palace. Unfortunately, the tomb was robbed in antiquity and all that remained in the main chamber sarcophagus were a handful of bone fragments. 
In the antechamber, the excavators found three bronze coffins containing skeletal remains and grave goods. Coffin two was placed first against the east wall and the sealed door of the main chamber. Coffin three was placed adjacent to it and coffin one on top of coffin two with an opposite orientation. The antechamber was sealed shut with two courses of bricks and a stone slab door. When first discovered, it was thought all of the coffins contained the fragmentary remains of numerous individuals in secondary burial contexts. This is clearly the case for coffin three, which held the partial remains of at least six individuals, and coffin one, which contained fragments of an adult woman and many children. However, the paleopathological evidence for coffin two shows an almost complete skeleton of a young woman who was found wearing a delicately crafted gold crown. The gold crown featuring leaves, flowers, grapes, and female winged genies was found in the skull of a gracile small female placed in the bronze coffin. The crown was recorded as object 480. Also found in this coffin were items such as stamp seals, cylinder seals, gold jewelry, a gold bowl, and a small juglet featuring narrative relief strips of kings in battle, hunting, and performing rituals. Among the jewelry discovered in Coffin 2 was a unique and extremely important pendant, Object 334. This gold royal stamp seal was located in the coffin near the head. Perhaps a young woman was wearing the pendant around her neck at the time of burial. The seal depicts a female worshiper, most likely the queen herself, standing before a goddess next to a recumbent lion, with a scorpion behind the throne a symbol associated with royal women. The inscription on the rim of the seal reads belonging to Hama, queen of Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, daughter-in-law of Adah Nirari. We know the king named to be Shalmaneser IV and not the third or fifth because he's the only Shalmaneser in the king list to follow an Adah Nirari. I propose that the young woman buried in coffin two who was found wearing the extraordinary gold crown should be identified as Hama, wife of Shalmaneser IV. The crown alone indicates royal status, and found a correlation with the seal naming the queen, it seems highly likely that this young woman was Hama. Moving to the osteology, coffin two contained the well-represented and well-preserved skeleton of a young petite woman, approximately five feet two inches tall, who died between the ages of 18 and 20. Unfortunately, no cause of death could be determined from the skeletal remains alone. The bones were all stained a dark green color from contact with the copper ions in the bronze coffin. In this particular case, when viewed microscopically, it could be seen that this was not a superficial copper patina, as was found on some of the other skeletal remains, but had been absorbed into the vascular channels of the compact bone. This happens when the copper component in the bronze reacts with hydrogen ions, which are a natural byproduct of body decomposition. This reaction creates copper carbonate, which seeps into the pore spaces of bones and teeth, and the affected material takes on the green color of the copper carbonate. You may be wondering why this is important. I found a handful of misconceptions of the material published about this coffin, which I would like to address. The other coffins contain fragmentary skeletons representing a number, of in, a number of individuals, so secondary burials. Those people died somewhere else and their bones were removed and combined in a bronze coffin later. In the young woman's skeleton, for the copper to be absorbed into the bones, it had to be present during the entire decomposition process, indicating this individual was primarily interred in a bronze coffin, not buried elsewhere and moved to one later. Also, copper ions are bactericidal, thus they kill microorganisms, which leads to better preservation. The cranial bones of the young woman in coffin two were not impregnated with copper or as well preserved, shown in the bone diagram by the absence of black fill and the presence of the hash marks, indicating fragmented bone. This is because the woman was wearing the gold crown and the gold blocked the copper from getting to the skull bones. Furthermore, the excavators of the tomb described the locations of jewelry in the coffin as corresponding to the body part where it would have been worn. I take this to demonstrate that the body was placed in a common burial position before decomposition. This confirms that disarticulated bones were not moved to the coffin at a later time. In summary, I propose this was a primary, not secondary burial for young Queen Hama. Many publications describe the skeletal remains of coffin two as a young woman and a child. Remember the chart I showed in an earlier slide from the paleopathology report. This is misleading because the only evidence of a child present in the coffin comes from three small bone fragments. That does not really equal uh, an entire child, right? Subadult bones are more fragile than adults and thus do not preserve well. Conversely, children's teeth do preserve well in the archaeological record and are often used as indicators of the presence of a child. For instance, conserving the Nimrud bronze coffins, Coffin one is said to have contained the fragmentary remains of an adult woman and more than six children. Three to five of these were identified by the presence of their teeth alone and the others from both bones and teeth. 
However, back to coffin two, there were no children's teeth present, which would be expected if a child had been buried there. An insignificant handful of bone fragments does not necessarily equal a full child, so I suggest that there was no child primarily buried with the young queen. Furthermore, the adolescent bones were only superficially stained green, which indicates they were deposited in a bronze coffin at an advanced stage of decomposition. As shown above, the young woman in the coffin was deposited soon after death, uh, and it is unlikely a handful of already defleshed children's bones was tossed into the coffin with her at that time. The overly fragmented nature of the bones suggests they infiltrated the coffin, or more precisely, the plastic bag the coffin remains were in at a later date. This theory is supported by the fact that in the plastic bag of bones labeled coffin two, there were also a few miscellaneous adult bones, which did not belong to the young woman. At this juncture, I do not have a definitive answer as to why these extra bones were present in the bag, although there could have been contamination from other coffins, either in antiquity or during excavations. Coffin one contained a number of teeth and bone fragments from numerous fetuses, infants, and adolescents, and it is possible that the bone pieces of the child found in the coffin two plastic bag belong with these children. Now that we've found Hama and I've introduced you to her, it's time to put her life and her death into context. She was a primary consort to Shalmanes IV, who reigned from 782 to 773 BC. Regarding textual data, unfortunately, Neo-Assyrian administrative texts list queens by title, not by name. There is only one text from the Nimrud wine list, which is a corpus discussing wine rations dating to 779 BC, which mentions the queen's servant, her leather worker, and her household overseer. Presumably, this would correspond to the reign of Shalmaneser IV, and thus Hama, and that is the only textual evidence we have of her. Along with studying Hama, I've been trying to reconstruct a postmortem history for the bronze coffin burials overall. Hama's body was found in a bronze coffin placed with other coffins in the antechamber to someone else's tomb who lived a century before her. Was this always her final resting place, or was she moved here in her coffin years after her death? The indiscriminate placement of the coffins and the commingled nature of the bones in the other coffins suggests this was more of a storage location, location than the original final resting place. For some of the people in the other coffins, they do not even have all of their bones. Back to the paleo paleopathology report chart. Though the list implies whole individuals, this is not the case. When we look at specific bones preserved, we get a better picture of the situation. Coffin one contained partial remains of a woman and many children. As you can see in the skeleton diagrams, by the black representing bones present, there are only bits and pieces of each skeleton, plus many extra miscellaneous bones and teeth that could not be linked to the others. In coffin three, uh, coffin three contained the long bones of three men and the skulls of two women, as well as miscellaneous fragments of teeth, uh, fragments and teeth of both adults and children that did not belong to the other skeletons. So a few important points here. Hama is the only well-preserved and well-represented skeleton from the bronze coffins. And she's actually the best preserved skeleton and identification from all of the Nimrud tombs. In coffin one, many of the sub-adults were only identified by a handful of teeth. The female bones in coffin three were only identif identifiable through a few skull pieces. Despite the report chart listing five individuals in coffin three, there were fragments of many more, including children and 30 random teeth. There was also an unlabeled bag of dirt that had bones in it that the paleopathologist did not know the context for. Perhaps it came from the, the floor around the coffins. Uh, the bones have different patinas. Some are stained green from the bronze coffins, some very dark green, some very light green. Some of them are brown and black speckled, showing that the bodies initially decomposed in different burial environments. Also, a few of the bones from one individual showed evidence of mild heating. So yet another post-mortem event to understand with these individuals. Additionally, there were also grave goods in these coffins. So whomever collected the bones was also collecting burial items. Perhaps the women and children in coffin one were related, were related to the eighth century general Shamshi Ilu, whose gold bowl was found with them. It is clear from the skeletal remains that in regard to coffins one and three, someone collected defleshed, disarticulated bones and put them into the coffins. But where did they come from? Julian Reed has hypothesized that a set of vaulted chambers below rooms 74 and 75 in Astronastropol's palace may have been tomb chambers based on their subterranean location and their similar architecture. Recently, Yasmina Wicks, in her book about bronze coffins, has further proposed that these chambers were the original resting place for the coffins found in the tomb three antechamber. 
Without going to Nimrod itself, to test this hypothesis, I channeled my high school math self and I used geometry. The excavation reports state that the bricks in this area measure 30 by 30 by seven centimeters. By counting courses in the photos, I was able to calculate the doorway sizes up to the arches. Unfortunately, even the smallest of the bronze coffins is too large to fit through the door, though I admit there is sediment buildup making the doorways you know, slightly shorter today. Additionally, the vertical entrance to these rooms, that would be here, uh, is quite narrow with sharp corners and would be difficult to get bronze coffins through it. Instead of the coffins being entombed here, perhaps these chambers were for, for lack of a better term, the uncoffined skeletons. Uh, this might explain the brown speckling on some of the bones, which would indicate that decomposition took place in an environment with dirt and organic material. The excavation report for this area mentioned a few bones in the corner of the long chamber, but no analysis or details were given. They were likely from a later period, but they support the room use as tombs. Tomb three was built from Alyssa Makanshat Ninua, wife of Ashur Nasrba II and mother of Shamaniza III, dating the tomb construction to the 9th century BC. All of the bronze coffins in the tomb three antechamber date to the 8th century BC. There were two burial events for these coffins, one being the actual deaths of the individuals, exact dates unknown, and another for when the bones were collected into coffins one and three and placed with coffin two into the antechamber. The earliest date from Hamasil is 782 BC, and the latest date in the tombs is 727 BC, according to a duck weight inscribed with the name Tiglath Pileser that was found in the, in the tomb. There's no data to indicate where Hama's coffin was initially placed before being moved to the antechamber of tomb three, but it is doubtful this was her original resting place. Looking at how the bronze coffins were packed into this room, it seems as if they were in storage, so to speak. But when did this happen? It is likely Tiglath Pileser was a king who ordered the bronze coffins to be placed into the antechamber around the time when he buried his wife Yaba in the tomb next door, tomb two. Tomb two and tomb three are in uh, corresponding rooms. Tablets found in room 57, which is above tomb three, date to his reign showing he was using this area of the palace, as does the aforementioned duckweight. Julian Reed has proposed that the coffins or skeletons were buried in the area of Nimrud near Ashur Nasrpal II's palace, where Tiglath Pileser was building his own central palace, which is a quite logical idea. As Tiglath Pileser built his central palace, he simply moved the coffins that he found, or the skeletons, uh, placing them in an already established mortuary area. To conclude, there's little textual data referencing Hama specifically, or any early Assyrian queen for that matter. Luckily, despite this, we have the skeletal remains and grave goods, which can offer a different type of insight and analysis. This helps in reconstructing a much fuller picture of these women's lives, especially young Queen Hama. In life, she may have been less well known, only ruling the palace for a short time and dying young. But now in death, her name, which has been immortalized through her burial, will live on forever. Thank you very much for listening to my talk. Great, thank you so much for your presentation. I think we'll move on here to our final speaker in this session, uh, Dr. Jason Orr. Dr. Orr is Stephen Phillips Professor of Archaeology and Ethnology in the Department of Anthropology at Harvard University. He specializes in early urbanism, landscape archaeology, and remote sensing particularly the use of declassified US intelligence imagery and has directed field surveys in Syria, Iraq, Turkey, and Iran. He is the author of Urbanism and Cultural Landscapes in Northeastern Syria, the Tel Hamakar Survey. Since 2012, Dr. Orr has directed the Erbil Plain Archaeological Survey. The title of his talk is The Erbil Plain Archaeological Survey, Kurdistan Region of Iraq. Great, thank you, Jean. Um, thank you, uh, Amanda, for organizing and inviting me, and, and thanks everybody for, for joining. I'm gonna give a, a quick overview of the results of our, our projects, which have been, uh, we've, we've been accumulating these over the years since we started in 2012. So our project is a survey that's designed to, to address one particular question, was the landscape of the Assyrian core plant? Uh, I came to this question in large part because my previous time spent investigating early Bronze Age landscapes found that they were highly engineered, but that this engineering was largely emergent. It was not planned, but emerged from the actions of, of, of individuals. 
The Assyrian case, however, suggested that things might be otherwise. Uh, I'll give you the, the basis for this with the example of the landscape around Nineveh. For one, we see very large planned cities, such as the, the ultimate capital of the Assyrian Empire um, seen here at Nineveh. There's evidence for hydraulic engineering in the form of canals and especially uh, aqueducts, such as the, the massive feature uh, at Jirwan. There's really interesting evidence for the possibility of demographic engineering through rural colonization, especially the movement of captured peoples uh, through processes of de deportation. We see a signature of this in the archeology span of the region to the, to the west of, of Nineveh. And finally, there's good evidence for a type of ideological engineering of the landscape through the careful placing of ideologically charged monuments. Now, here you're seeing the, the reliefs uh, at Hinnis um, on the left and newly, newly rediscovered and, and new discovered panels uh, near the canal at, at Fida. They're just emerging over the course of the last year. So taken together, this seems like good evidence that a lot of thought went into the structure of the Assyrian core around Nineveh, but everything that I presented has been largely anecdotal uh, based on visits from various archeologists over the course of the last 150 years. What was really needed was uh, a targeted project to, to answer this question. And that's what brings us to uh, Erbil. Uh, so since uh, 2011, uh, the Erbil region has become particularly friendly to foreigners, geopolitically secure, uh, and generally a, a great place to do research, very open to collaboration. And it also happens to fall right in what is the uh, kind of eastern part of the so-called Assyrian Triangle. You can see here that uh, parts of the Erbil plain are actually closer to Nimrud than they are to uh, Erbil. So I toyed with calling this project the land behind Nimrud, but I thought that maybe that, that had already been done over enough. Uh, so let me say a bit about uh, our methods. Now we have a specific question to answer here regarding the, the planned or not planned nature of the landscape. So we designed methods that were designed really specifically to bring us to this question. Um, for one, we chose a region uh, in, the, in, in the Assyrian core. Um, we're looking at 3,200 square kilometers around the city of Erbil, uh, the capital of the Kurdistan region of Iraq today. Um, this is an area that was not completely unknown. There had been some, some few excavations uh, prior to 2011, but really a, a big explosion of them since. So the region is known uh, a bit through excavations. Interestingly, though, we're in the core of the Assyrian Empire. Most of the excavations really focus on prehistory. In fact, the, the LC1 and 2 periods have seen the bulk of these, of these excavations. Uh, so the project being a landscape project designed to look at landscape features, it started with uh, a series of declassified images, especially a corona scene from February of 1967, which you see here. And from this, we extracted over 1,500 potential archaeological sites, which you see here in, in black. Uh, in addition, we identified almost 200 uh, linear kilometers of pre-modern canals, uh, a little over 150 kilometers of hollow way, uh, trackway, pre-modern trackway features, and about 12,000 shafts of Kares features. So this is an extraordinarily busy and full archeological landscape, not just archeological sites. Now, since 2012, we've had, uh, what are we up to? I guess we're up to seven field seasons now, counting uh, the 2021 field season, which is happening while I speak. I am not present, but um, my team is in the field right now. We've covered roughly one third of the area that we set out to, to cover. So as I mentioned, we make extensive use of historical aerial and satellite photographs, especially from the declassified Corona spy satellite program and its successor, the Hexagon program. And most recently we found declassified images of U-2 chess uh, aerial flyovers visited, uh, visited the site in the late 1950s. These sources are fantastically useful for identifying archeological sites. They all have their various strengths 
Corona is especially good at detecting the anthropogenic nature of soils, the soil discoloration uh, that um, it shows archaeological sites. The U2 imagery was very uh, early in the morning and therefore uh, there's a lot of shadows being cast, so it's good at finding topography. We actually find modern imagery to not be very useful with one exception. We have to get to these places to survey them and the modern imagery shows us where the tracks are. So we use the modern imagery mostly for navigation rather than for site recognition. Now, starting a couple of years ago, we've been putting all of our spatial data into the cloud through ArcGIS Online, which means that it can be shared with all team members, including our Kurdish colleagues in Erbil, uh, via web mapping applications, such as you, as you see here. We can also push this data out to um, tablets and smartphones so that every field team member who has uh, a data-enabled device in their pocket has a access to 100% of our data in real time. As we update it, it's then sent out to everyone else. So um, very, very democratically distributed uh, data on our project. We're very proud of that. Uh, our latest addition is we've begun to use uh, dashboards to update uh, our finds. These are not publicly accessible yet, um, but they are accessible to antiquities authorities in, especially in Erbil, so that uh, our our administrative colleagues always have full access to everything that, that we're doing. So once we've identified these sites from satellite imagery, we visit them through a field survey. We use a method that was largely pioneered by Tony Wilkinson, although he built a bit on what Robert McCormick Adams had done. Um, we, are, uh, we are not a transect walking project, such as you see in the, um, uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, that simply would not allow us to cover the area that we need to cover in order to address our primary question about uh, Assyrian planning. So we are a vehicular um, in how we get to our, our sites. And when we map our sites, we have, uh, we've never used total stations, but we have especially shifted since 2016 to using drone photogrammetry. Uh, this is an element of our project that was very quickly taken on by our Kurdish colleagues. So you're seeing uh, Khalil uh, Barzinji, who is our pilot, um, with uh, Nader Babakur, my, my co-director. Uh, Khalil runs the drone program. Uh, in 2018, we upgraded our project with an EB SenseFly um, device, which can fly for about an hour and cover um, cover um, many, many more hectares than the EB, and this is also has an extremely precise uh, GPS on board. So at this point, we are now um, drone mapping 100% of the sites that, that we find. Um, the process goes like this. Uh, the drone goes up and takes photographs, but um, these are not opportunistic. These are taken at regular intervals along transects with very prescribed amounts of overlap. And that overlap allows us to bring uh, the, these photographs together to create proper data. So here you're seeing on the right, uh, a terrain model made from drone um, photogrammetry compared to what you'd see through, for example, the shuttle radar topography uh, mission. Um, as you can see, it's much, much finer um, topographic data, really high quality site mapping. So with these methods in mind, I'm going to run through uh, some, a very little bit of our results in the, the time I have here. Um, we haven't um, processed results from 2021 just yet. As I said, we still have three or four more days in the field but that will be coming soon, hopefully by uh, the time of ASOR in Chicago. So we have, we have recovered this at this point almost 750 archaeological sites over about 1,300 square kilometers. Kilometers. Um, the patterns that we see emerging, I'm going to show you the very basic results that we found so far, are um, the, the bars on this chart represent the number of archaeological sites with prehistory on the left, um, stretching to uh, as, as late as the Parthian period on the right. Uh, and you can see as you move through time from left to right that there is a really stasis in the prehistoric period, but starting with the, the mid to late fourth millennium, there is really steady growth, uh, especially running through the Bronze Age, the Middle Bronze Age, and the Late Bronze Age, and with a particular peak in the Assyrian period, following by a collapse in the number of sites in the Hellenistic period, and then a resurgence in the Parthian period. 
The line that you see here is to be read against the, uh, the, the right axis. And this represents the total area uh, of settlement. And you can see that for the most part, the area of settlement, which we use as a proxy for population, it largely tracks alongside of the, the, the site numbers. In, in the, the little bit of time that I have here, I'm going to talk briefly about the, the landscape of the Middle Bronze Age. And then I'd like to turn to our primary intellectual focus, um, the Iron Age or the Neo-Assyrian Neo period. Um, the results of this work have just been published online in the, uh, in the early view version of uh, the journal Iraq, and they'll appear in print, um, uh, hopefully, um, within the next uh, month or so. I'll, I'll put a link to this, uh, to the publication in the, in the chat. Um, okay, let's talk about the Middle Bronze Age. At this time, um, at, well, at the height of the Middle Bronze Age, we'd say that the Northern Mesopotamia was largely unified under uh, Shamshi Adad ruling variously from Shubat Enlil, uh, Mari, or Ekalatum. Um, but encompassing an area that he'd conquered, which included a place called Cabra, formerly an independent kingdom until it was famously captured uh, jointly by, um, by forces from um, the Shamshiadid forces with, um, with uh, Dadusha from, from Eshnuna. Um, Glenn Schwartz just told you a bit about this, uh, and including the fact that we suspected that Cabra was to be found somewhere in the area of Erbil. Um, and so this is one of the first places we looked for. And um, Glenn also showed you this image where you can see um, pretty clearly a, a mounded site right here, but more, more extensively, you can see this white line that surrounds it that showed to us uh, the likelihood of a city wall. Um, we visited this site in 2012, took some photographs, did our best to, to convince Glenn to bring his Hopkins team there. And I'm very pleased that we've been successful there. We were also able to confirm that this was a Middle Bronze Age site, including um, some signs of that topographic wall here shown along the North Edge. Um, we have since flown this site with the drone and produced a high resolution DEM. Um, uh, Glenn and his team, especially Angie, Angie Creekmore, have done geophysics here, and it's been extremely gratifying that they have confirmed the dating here, and they've also confirmed the presence uh, of, of a city wall, which has led, um, I think, both Glenn and I to be pretty well convinced that, indeed, this is the, the former capital at, at Cabra. Uh, so finding lost capital cities is pretty cool, but I actually want to talk a bit about the settlement patterns behind uh, in the kingdom of, of Cabra. Uh, I can say that having done survey in Northeastern Syria, that the Middle Bronze Age pattern around Cabra is really completely unremarkable compared to the other small kingdoms uh, of the Middle Bronze Age. Um, Cabra is very large on the order of some, something like 90 hectares, according to Glenn. Um, but the rest of the landscape is a series of small uh, towns relatively evenly spaced and placed in really close proximity to water. You'll notice that most of them cling fairly closely to the, the blue lines here, which represent uh, wadis, which very well might have been um, perennial uh, at the time of the Middle Bronze Age. So bear this particular pattern in mind as we turn to the landscape of the imperial core of, uh, of Assyria. Our results here have been very um, impressive and very gratifying and I'll review them here. Uh, for one, I'll, I'll say that almost all of the aspects of planning that we anticipated to find based on what I've done around uh, Nineveh, they all show up here in, uh, in the, on the Erbil plain. For one, we have very large scale urbanism. This is Kasr Shamamak, ancient Kilizu, with a very, very clear um, high mound featuring known palaces and an oval-shaped lower town with a wall, very large capital city that um, uh, the French team um, has been excavating since uh, 2011. Um, Kasr Shamamak is highly, highly exceptional, however. Overwhelmingly, the Iron Age or Neo-Syrian landscape looks like this. Very small sites today surviving to maybe half a meter, a meter and a half in height. Um, rarely exceeding more than one or two hectares and in great numbers. It's a highly, highly rural landscape, uh, this, this, the capital. 
the distribution of these sites, you can see here, you, you can see the, the great number of them. Um, but also, if you look, you'll see that unlike the Middle Bronze Age pattern, these sites don't cling so closely to water. The, the settlements of the Neo-Assyrian period were far more likely to appear in what we would consider to be marginal areas, areas further away from water, more susceptible to drought on years when, uh, uh, you know, crop failure on years of drought. And, um, but again, um, very, very, very small. Uh, so this looks to us to be the sort of thing that we would expect if we were seeing the kind of agricultural colonization uh, that we predicted uh, based on some other surveys done in, in in northeastern Syria. So it does appear to us at this point that we are seeing an influx. And because of the marginality of these of the site locations, we are assuming that it may that this may be sort of a planned kind of colonization rather than people choosing themselves where to go. They're being placed in places, and in some cases, kind of rather unpleasant or, or agriculturally marginal places that they might not otherwise choose to go to. Other planned aspects are also presence on the Erbil Plain. So you're looking here at a very large canal that stretches from one water course here um, to another one here, a large and deep uh, feature that ends in a, in a very big basin uh, at one side. This is a, a closer view of this feature from a hexagon, uh, hexagon spy photograph. Um, we flew this and a uh, with about 2,500 photos managed to create a digital elevation model of this entire uh, feature, which, which uh, really confirms its absolute monumentality. Uh, this feature would have taken many, many thousands of, of, of workers a long time to excavate. Here's a, a drone flyover, which gives you a better sense of the, the amazing scale of this feature. Um, for scale, the, this is Khalil, the, our drone pilot here on the, on the left. It's about 100 meters wide. It's over 10 meters deep. We don't find spoil from it. So it does appear that the material that um, was dug out of it was subsequently transported out, possibly for building materials um, uh, somewhere else. Uh, we also find evidence for Assyrian hydraulic engineering to the north of Erbil where for a long time uh, along the Bastura River, there's been a known canal head feature um, with ashlar masonry that you see here. This has been known since Fuad Safar published it in the 1940s. Uh, it had a cuneum reform inscription above it, which named Sennacherib as the king who commissioned it and described how it took water from the Bastura and other rivers and transported it underground to the city uh, of Erbil. So we have the canal head and our team was interested to fly the valley to get a sense of the, the topography around it. So here's the digital elevation model of the valley. And, and you can see on the, on the right and upper left uh, evidence of, of gravel excavation. This area is threatened by industry as the, the need for cement drives companies to, to uh, really pillage the, the floodplains of Kurdistan for gravel for, for cement. But we did find something that we weren't expecting. Um, when we put together the ortho photo of the same scene, you'll notice in the upper right, uh, a feature that it kind of looks like a pavement. If you look in closely, you'll see that the downstream edge is, is very carefully prepared. The upstream edge has been, has been damaged probably by floods and maybe by mining. But this is very clearly a massive dam. If you look at the scale there, you can see that this is 20, this is about 20 meters wide. And it runs, as we know, it runs for about 500 meters leading straight to that canal head. So clearly either somehow moving or diverting water in the direction of that canal head to flow to Erbil. So here we've mapped it for about 500 meters, but if we were to extend it to the right to the uh, furthest edge of the plane, that would add about another 500 meters. This is about a kilometer long, 20 meter wide feature that's since been flooded out and largely covered over by silts, but uh, truly a massive intervention in the landscape designed to reorient uh, the hydrology. Now, so what we're seeing is quite likely a very, very top-down imposed imperial landscape, what we were expecting to find. Um, we also find that it didn't last for very long. You see the Assyrian landscape on the left and on the right is what we have, the, the next glimpse of the landscape that we get, which is under the Hellenistic uh, or the Seleucid rule. 
we have a very poor control over Achaemenid ceramics at this point. So we, we can't really describe the Achaemenid landscape. But we can say that by the time of the Seleucid era, um, many of these small sites had vanished. The, the largest of the sites, uh, sites such as Kasser Shamamak, Kilizu, had become radically shrunk. Um, we don't have good evidence that any of these canals were remained in use either. So we really see, we see a really uh, a sharply reduced landscape in almost, in almost all senses. And this is another thing that we're working on very closely. Uh, Dr. Rocco Palermo, the, uh, the associate director of, of our project has, uh, he and I and uh, Lita Vaidi de Young, we've, we've just had accepted an article on uh, the Hellenistic landscapes of the plain that will appear hopefully this coming year in uh, the AJA. Um, our time is short around Erbil. The plain is developing really, really rapidly. You see it here in 1967 on the left, and then again in 2014 on the right. And you can see the degree to which the city is expanding outward in, in concentric circles. Uh, this is not going to stop happening. And the best that we can do is be aware of it and try to stay ahead of it. So when we see things like the planned future 150 meter ring road, we make sure that we survey this area and the area inside of it as quickly as we can so that the decision makers in the KRG can um, make whatever decisions that they're gonna make to preserve things or uh, conduct salvage work um, to get what information we can before they all disappear under the expanding, the expanding city. So uh, in conclusion, I wanna thank um, the team members of the Erbil Plain Archaeological Survey. I especially wanna thank um, my co-director, Nader Babaker, the Director of Antiquities for the Erbil Governorate, and also my associate directors, Rocco Palermo and uh, Petra Creamer, uh, who are in the field right now, carrying out our 2021 season. We had a short season last year, um, run entirely by our Kurdish team members under the direction of, of Kak Nader. Um, and our season so far this year has been a fantastic um, uh, collaboration between um, Iraqi Kurds and, and foreigners. So thanks to all of my team members for this. And I also wanna acknowledge the assistance of the KRG, both the general directorate, um, general director Kefi uh, Ali, um, Kak Nader, um, Babakur in Erbil, and also the KRG representation in, in Washington DC uh, has been extremely helpful uh, to us. Um, finally, I would like to thank um, you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody for presenting. Um, if you all would like to reappear, <laughs> we can take some questions uh, from the people who attended. Um, just to get started, there is a question for you, Dr. Pittman, um, about Al the Alhaba project. Are any of the seal impressions recovered from areas C and G now in the Penn Museum, or do they remain in Iraq? Have they been digitized and added to the Alhaba database, or are there plans for future publication of the glyptic? Um, we don't have anything um, here at Penn or at NYU. Um, all of the seal impressions were deposited at the uh, National Museum in Baghdad um, after each individual season. They were, um, I'm going to say that they weren't all photographed because in the earlier seasons, especially from Area C, um, there are a lot of entries in the data book that just says seal impression, seal impression, seal impression. But uh, we have digitized every um, photograph drawing of every seal impression that uh, we have. And from area G, when I was president and recorded all of that material, we have a, a full uh, record, both drawings and um, photographs, slides, everything. All of this material will be published in these um, final publication volumes. So area G is, uh, the, the study is essentially completed. Um, area C is now under the um, study of a graduate student of mine, Dr. Uh, David Mulder, and he'll be 
um, studying that material. And then there is a little bit of glyptic that we have from the other areas. So all of it will be um, provided um, and we hope to make the online database um, available through the web. Uh, we're still not um, there yet, but by the time these volumes appear, which I hope will be in the next couple of years, um, all that material will be available. So, you know, certainly feel free to contact me if you're interested in anything in particular. All right, thank you very much. Sure. Um, we have a question uh, for Dr. Orr from uh, attendee who joined late, but wanted to ask about inscriptions at the Bastora Dam and Canal Head. Have you uncovered any at the site? And if so, are they similar to the Jerwan Aqueduct? Kirsten, thanks for your question. Um, so yeah, the inscription at the at Bastora, first of all, it, it, you should be aware, it has been stolen. It was stolen in 1990, according to the, the local villagers. So it exists solely as copy uh, at this point. Uh, we haven't found any additional inscriptions. We found, we have found one fragmentary cuneiform text in our, uh, in our, all of our years of, of surveying. Um, not something that generally shows up on the, um, uh, not generally something that shows up on the, on the surface. Um, oh, uh, and yes, uh, Amanda, if you could share that link to the, the full group. Thank you. Um, we haven't found any more inscriptions. And it, I promise you, Kirsten, it is not for lack of searching. We were really hoping, uh, we, we have some small scale canals that really looked um, remarkably like the, the known canal system at FIDA, studied very well by Julian Reed and, and now by uh, Daniela Morandi. Uh, we were really hoping that some of these other canals that we saw in imagery would have similar relief panels. But when we visited them, we found out that they had been dug into um, kind of a really loose gravelly earth rather than into um, kind of a, a, a firm stone foundation. So we didn't get any uh, Feta style reliefs, at least we haven't found any yet. Um, we, we were really hoping to, those, those, would, those would turn up. Um, this is a much higher populated area and has been highly populated. So we are anticipating that um, you know, monuments that, you know, stele or something like that have almost certainly been reworked, reused, removed um, over the years. So we're still looking, but we're not very optimistic. All right, thank you very much. Um, if you, uh, as the participants in the session have questions for each other, I also invite you to ask them. Um, I had a question for you, Tracy. Um, and when you call your, you described your dissertation as a digital archeology span dissertation. And I wondered if you could say a little bit about the methodology and what that represents um, when you use that description. Um, well, I ran uh, a number of, spatial analytical models to try and access or try to look at access and movement throughout the palace. Um, so I was running, uh, kind of going blank here, I haven't looked at it a bit, <laughs> uh, different models trying to look at uh, view sheds for the different rooms, uh, trying to look at depth for the different rooms, uh, and also trying to assess different entrances to the Sennacherib's palace. So most people really only focus on the main throne room entrance and the main throne room courtyard. But if you look at the plans and you read the text, there are more than one main entrance. There's a separate Western uh, terrace that is its own suite that is almost completely separated from the interior of the palace uh, that you would have very difficult, be difficult to access. So I assess that. Um, and I also assess there's a a back hallway that's actually a tunnel going down from the top of the tell to the bottom of the tell, which I suspect was something used by uh, uh, staff of some sort. Um, so I was also running models where you would upload a plan and then you can drop stick figure people into different rooms of the palace and then they wander around uh, and you can kind of watch how these people walk in their movement. Um, and then what I did is I took this, these movement analyses on uh, these uh, diagrams and tree graphs and everything and tried to actually assess the art 
So how can we look at the palace reliefs and the content of the palace reliefs and who may or may not have seen the reliefs based on their location within the palace and movement? I will be presenting on it at ASOR. Right. Um, good. Thank in you. person. Good. Yes. Good. Um, Holly, there's another question for you. Do you have an estimated date for when the pottery production area at Al Hibo was abandoned? Um, the, you know, Augusta could um, probably answer that better than I, but my, my understanding is that the pottery from the tomb, or to tombs, the kilns, was early dynastic three. And we have very little later pottery on the surface of the mound. And so um, I would guess that what we would assume is that it was at the end of the early dynastic three period. And probably the mound, the, the city was severely disturbed through all of the political unrest with Lugal Zagazi and all of that at the very end of the early dynastic before the consolidation of the of the Acadians. And we know from inscriptions that water courses were um, disrupted and everything. And so um, I, I there's there is um, and Darren can correct me if I'm wrong on this. There is Acadian um, and a little bit of or three in the in the temple areas, um, but in area C um, and I think in area H, certainly in area G, it's all early dynastic um, one through late three. All right, thank you very much. Um, Jason, could I ask you, since you have a team in the field right now, if uh, I know that people are curious about um, what the scope of field work looks like these days in, you know, what we hope is increasingly a post-pandemic world. Yeah, um, I am. I am there mainly because I have a particular. You know, I take a medication that inspires me to not get on an airplane. So uh, the the conditions, as they've been described to me by my team, are that. Um, well, there isn't a whole lot of mask use um, and public, the public health situation, knowledge about it is, is, is not terribly clear. However, field research such as excavation and survey being almost entirely conducted outside mm -hmm. um, is something that I, I would imagine, certainly, certainly my, you know, as my team discussed whether or not we were gonna go to the field, this was a, a huge issue. What to, to what degree are, are you comfortable? So uh, we have a small team uh, that is being that is that is obviously housed in in a in a separate uh, bubble and that spends almost all of its time uh, outside. So hopefully field work can um, can resume given given that what we do is is largely outside. I can say that our Iraqi and Kurdish colleagues badly miss us and not not just the uh, academic participation but also. Um, the funding that we bring as well. You know, our projects have real economic impacts with our colleagues that um, when, when, these, when, when we disappear, there can be some real suffering. So um, I hope we can all get back very soon for, for both of those reasons. Sure. Can I add a comment on that one? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm actually in Mosul right now. Oh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, with the, um, the University of Bologna team at Nineveh. And yes, you're correct. There are very few masks anywhere. You see a few when you're in the city, like within Mosul, but no, we bought masks. We have masks. Uh, we have drinking water. We bought separate cups for all of the workers. Um, so we're trying, we have hand washing, but you're right. It's, it seems, it's, people don't seem to take it as seriously as in North America. Um, we've all been fine so far, so far, fingers crossed. Uh, but also all of us, um, I'm, coming from um, Canada, the University of Toronto, we're all vaccinated. So I think that was kind of like a helpful push that, okay, we've been vaccinated, let's try it. Yeah. So far, okay. I'll report back at ASOR. All right, if it's not. So if there are, are there any other questions, either from the presenters or from those attending? Yes, Jason. Could I ask a question uh, to, to Glenn? 
Um, I've I've been so so impressed with um, uh, the work at Kurd Kabristan, um, obviously, especially with the geophysics, um, given uh, how nicely it, it, it's it's connected with um, the, the the satellite remote sensing. Um, could you give an update on what you and Andy are intending to, to do moving forward? I, I understand, did I hear like 45% of the site has been covered and, and will you continue? Uh, yeah, um, thanks. Um, well, 48 hectares, I think 48 hectares. the figure. So if the site is 95, then it's a little under, what? Well, it's about half, right? It's about half. Yeah. Um, Andy is somewhat skeptical about uh, doing geophysics on the high mound because he, he would expect there's a mix of different periods and, and the results not, might not be that useful. But I frankly would like to look at the high mount, especially the edges of it, where apparently there's middle Bronze Age fortification. Um, no, I play, I, I, we, we would like to uh, have a season in the spring. It's been quite a while since we've been able to have one. Um, and I'm struggling with the same issues that, um, you know, that, that Jean was asking about uh, and Tracy was talking about. Um, and I'm sure that Johns Hopkins will have its own opinion about what I will be allowed to do. Uh, but yeah, but, but our, our intention would, would, was actually to have a big push with the geophysics in our next season. Um, there's a very interesting area uh, to the east of the high mound where your survey results indicated the presence of late bronze. Uh, uh, you know, occupation, and we haven't been able to, to uh, work there uh, because there's been, uh, there, the, the, there's modern um, irrigation going on and so forth, and, and it would be disruptive. Uh, of course, if it is late Bronze Age, uh, it might not work so well with the results we've gotten from the rest of the site, which are middle Bronze Age, we assume. Um, but anyway, yeah, we, we, we would love to continue, and I, I'd, I'd, I'd certainly consider the geophysical component of the project to be extremely important. That would be, I'd be very interested to know what your late Bronze Age lower town looks like. Um, you know, the nature of late Bronze Age urbanism, especially Mitanni urbanism, if you can, if there is such a thing, is, is getting to be an interesting question in that where we, we know of it, for example, um, Newsy and, and Tel Brock, there seems to be a really sharp uh, vertical distinction between um, palaces and temples and, and residential areas. Brock certainly has a very, very strong vertical distinction. Um, and it would be interesting to see if this model repeats itself. It seems to repeat at, at Newsy, but it would be nice to get more data and Kurt Kabristan could, could really test that model in an interesting way. So good luck. Thanks. Well, I think we're really coming to the end of our time. Is there any uh, final comments that anyone would like to make? Um, and if not, I would like to thank you, uh, the presenters for um, giving us such interesting information today and for all of those who attended. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you, Jean. Thank, thank you, Amanda. You. Yeah.